Hi and good morning everyone and welcome um, to this presentation. So thank you Michelle for the introduction. Uh, my name is Ruth McAllister, I'm Head of Research and Intelligence for a company called Harrod Associates. Um, we're based in London, I'm obviously not from London, you have guessed, um, but we opened up our Belfast office a few months ago, so I'm very pleased to be here and speak on behalf of the company. So in terms of you know, the format today. Firstly, I will introduce myself properly, explain more about my background, for example. I'll also explain what I mean by open source intelligence. I have a lot of acronyms in my presentation, I'll explain them all, don't worry. Particularly, I'll be exploring the social and the technical. Um, I'm a social scientist by background, so I feel a little bit out of my depth with all these brilliant technical people um, in the room. I'm going to talk around a few case studies. Um, human trafficking is one, and sexual offending. Um, I'm just going to throw out the caveat right now. Um, the sexual offending aspect is around CSAM, or child sexual abuse material. I am not in any way discussing anything graphic. It's very much about technical discussion, so don't worry about anything like that. I'll then mention a little bit around AI. Uh, I mean, a room full of technical people, I haven't got to explain very much around that, of course, but it really is impacting on some of the work that I do. And I think working with technical people, social scientists like me, can really help further our work around bad actors in the online space. So about me, uh, I'm an academic, for better or for worse, uh, for 15 years. I was a full-time academic in UU teaching in criminology and I developed the cybercrime curriculum there. For the last two years I have been part-time because I jumped into the private sector where I now investigate cybercrimes and, and other types of issues in the online environment. Criminology for me was very much social science based and I tried to change that to make it more interdisciplinary and technical. I have worked a lot with computer science both within Ulster University and also in universities across the water in England. I work a lot with various ROCUs, Regional Organised Crime Units, and also with PSNI here with the Cyber Crime Unit. In terms of my research, um, I really am interested in technology and how it facilitates human trafficking and modern slavery. I work a lot within child sexual abuse environments and I've also investigated Russian hacking. Unfortunately, I'd be here for three hours if I was to cover everything in depth. Don't worry, I'm not going to. Um, unfortunately, I have decided not to talk about the, the Russian hacking today, just in case. Um, what do I do now? I lead investigations across a variety of areas within Howard Associates, everything from harassment, fraud, asset tracing, and I use open source intelligence tools and I do a little bit of code as well. I am not a programmer, but I can do little bits to help me if I need to. So, I am not going to read every single point on these slides, don't worry. Um, I just want to give a bit of a background, if you like, about how I came to be where I am. And in terms of criminology, and especially with cybercrime, a lot of crime sites now, they happen in what we do, cyberspace. Of course, crime still happens on the streets, offline crime, I fully appreciate that. But we have to really think around new ways to conceptualise this online environment. What or where is cyberspace? That's like a $64,000 question, for example, that people actually do struggle to answer. And also, how does it differ from this real world or physical crimes? I would argue that actually it can be more impactive for victims due to a lack of understanding and a lack of support whenever they have been a victim of crime in the online environment. And that can be anything from doxing to fraud to um, intimate abuse images being shared online. <laughs> so what we have now is a really, really rich source of data that's available a lot of the time in online forums. A lot of research has been undertaken, for example, in carding forums. That's been traditional thought around cybercrime investigation. Now for me as a social scientist, how the heck to analyze thousands and thousands and thousands of posts I mean, to do that manually, um, I probably lose the will to live um, very, very quickly, I would say. So this is one of the, the key thoughts I had in my head a few years ago, how do I get around this issue? 
Of course, you can use automated tools, but instead I knocked on the door of the computer science department and said, let's try and work together. They were very confused by me. I'm not going to lie at the start. Um, but they, they, they soon understood where I was going with my requests for help and information. So from working with you know technical experts, people like yourselves in this room, um, I've been able to undertake a lot of really valuable research, and that's what I'm going to share with you today. Why is that important now for my job? Because from this research, I gather intelligence from a lot of common identifiers, closed source information, and open source information, and I pass that straight to law enforcement to help them go after the bad guys and girls. So what is open source intelligence? It's essentially public data. Um, I don't hack to get the data. Um, that's just un unethical, if you like, from our perspective. So everything that I look at is publicly available, open source, it's available online. Some examples of open source intelligence, you can see it could be public records, even information and planning applications, for example. Social media can be a dream at times. Um, sometimes meta make it very difficult, but I'll move on from that. Um, news articles, again, can be a wealth of information, um, information images and videos as well, just as a few examples of what we can um, utilise in our work. Everything's publicly available, as I've said, and everything is acquired through legal means. Sockment or social media intelligence is generally a sub-discipline of OSINT. Um, you have humans as well, human intelligence, you have tech and you can see all the, the various acronyms around the, the screen there. I personally work within OSINT and SOCMINT. I do a little bit around GEOINT, which is Geospatial Intelligence as well. What's it used for? Primarily in my work for investigation. Um, I do a lot of fraud investigation, that will come as no surprise. Um, I liked the, the thoughts around generative AI and going after the fraudsters and closing their bank accounts. But there's a little uh, reminder for, to follow up on that one from my perspective. Um, defamation, slander, um, we can profile buildings, geographic areas. It's also useful for our families. You know, anyone involved in a data breach, for example, there's been quite a few recently. Um, you know, you can come to me and I'll check that you're safe and publicly available information is locked down as much as it can be. Um, we can also check out employees, for example. If you're a CEO, for example, or a hire within a company, you want to know who you're going to employ. Is there any insider threat, for example? Due diligence can be quite useful as well to check out the background of people. So the, the first area I want to talk about, and I do this, I have a, a leg straddled in the university and a leg straddled within um, Harvard Associates whenever I do this work around human trafficking. Whenever I began this, um, like I say, I was a social science researcher, and you know, from my perspective, this is very, very qualitative, very manual, and also very, very slow in terms of how I do this research and get my information. It's really problematic for, for two key reasons. It's difficult to extrapolate qualitative data and apply that across the board. It's very, very difficult to draw from a very small sample. Huge spaces of data, like I said, they cannot be analysed manually. So what I was interested in is how technology has impacted on trafficking itself. So how has that impacted particularly on recruitment exploitation and how do I go about assessing this. So the first thing just to highlight is that human trafficking and concerns around it, we hear modern slavery mentioned quite a lot, for example, even in the media, these concerns are not new. There is a general consensus, I would say, throughout the public that there has been an explosion, particularly in sex trafficking, and that's due to technology. So therefore, with some of my colleagues, it seems quite logical that the solution to this increased speed of technology is to combat it with technology. Okay, timely investigations, machine learning techniques, we can better understand movement and transition patterns through um, various societies and countries within Europe. So we need to better understand trafficking and technology. So. There are lots and lots and lots of claims 
that tools can identify and reduce investigation time. But from a social science perspective, human trafficking is extremely difficult to investigate. We're talking about serious and organised crime. You simply just can't go and knock the door of a person and ask an interview questions about their involvement in the movement of people illegally. That does not happen. So it's very, very difficult to investigate. So therefore, whenever I look at statistics around trafficking, how can they be so specific? We don't know exactly who has and who has not been the victim of trafficking in a particular city or country. So therefore, have algorithms accurately captured trafficking victims? So we have this focus on technology, but has anybody ever asked the question, number one, what actually is sex work? What is sex trafficking? And how can technology really work to combat that? So there can be a distinction, if you like, to really think about within this trafficking and technology nexus how trafficking victims even define themselves. And trust me, a lot of them do not define as victims, but that is probably a whole other uh, conference talk. So from a really critical perspective, it's impossible to remove bias from data. And the interpretation is often restricted to the conceptual framework of an investigator. So for example, if I ask an expert, to identify a suspicious advert online, how would they do that? You would probably think of your own personal perspective, I would imagine, around what suspicion is, what risk is, what might or may not look suspicious. So that can be a real difficulty. So there is a common, if you like, trap where people can conflate data and it doesn't actually represent what it claims to represent. So we have to think about a person's understanding of trafficking. So going back to what I said before, it's working with people who understand it, the social scientists who work in this area, the NGOs, for example, working with experts like you within technology to better develop these technical solutions. Even when models have been trained and have been successfully trained, by the way, to distinguish between what is a suspicious advert and non-suspicious, and trust me, that is really, really difficult if you think about the nuances of that. The very conception of what is suspicious is constructed by one, two, three, maybe four people. So you have to really think around the accuracy of that as well. So therefore, it's really compelling to suggest that because technology has increased trafficking, Therefore, let's use technology to combat it. I would say let's make it part of the answer and let's obviously work much better together. Data from open sources or websites is, is really, really important, but we have to really be quite critical around how we interpret this data, interpret this information. So what I really wanted to do was investigate properly and thoroughly how we can reduce the demand at source. How can we prevent the recruitment of human beings into the trafficking arena? So there are three key stages in the trafficking process, as you can see in the screen. You have recruitment, you have transportation, and you have exploitation. I wanted to go to the very front end, the recruitment, to stop it. A lot of work has been done at the end, the exploitation. So how do we better do that? So as a social scientist, I began looking at adverts myself and I wanted to see what was suspicious. I have redacted the full email addresses, so this is not people's personal information on the screen. Um, I was working within Romania at the time because Romania is a key source country for human trafficking into the UK and really has been in the NRM stats now for really quite a few years. In this example, you can see from the website that there is an email address, bby91 at yahoo.com, looking for girls 18 years who are serious, uh, willing to work, and they are guaranteed 6,000 euros a month. Now, would that be a red flag to anybody? Yes. If I earn 6,000 euros a month, I probably would not be standing here. So, yes, 
that is a definite red flag, of course. Um, and of course, then we have Matt at your who, uh, again, Manchester escort away from crowds in danger. I'm just with my girlfriends. Um, I want one or two girls. This is all a direct translation from Romanian, by the way, just for your information of the adverts. And to cut a very long story short, within this particular aspect of the research, I were able to connect these two individuals that they were working out of the same apartment in Manchester. So what I can do then, um, using open source tools, I can enrich the email to get other personal identifiers to help me work out who these individuals are. Unfortunately, um, I redacted everything, so of course you, you can't see it. Suffice to say that you know you can see you know, IP addresses, reach data, for example, I can pivot off as well. Well, it was really quite useful for one of the emails. Um, the second email as well, you can see um, breach data, which is very helpful for investigators um, to pivot off again, and, and that was particularly useful. I eventually was able to track down the two individuals to an apartment block in Manchester and handed that information over to um, the police to let them deal with them. The next one um, is involving a lady who calls herself Beatrice. Um, you can see that I've obviously blurred that image, but I have concerns around this particular advert that I found online in terms of recruitment and also exploitation. So very I identified Beatrice, um, and there was a partial phone number um, on that particular advert that I obviously haven't shown and an email address. I was able to track um, that phone number to a particular posting on Facebook, and you can see it's called a Romanian gathering in Leeds. So again, we're tied to the country of Romania. Um, I could identify the phone number, but I also have a man behind that phone number. So again, I was able to see number one, who had liked that post, which was really key in the investigation because Beatrice had liked the post. But of course, Beatrice used her real Facebook profile to do that. So that was very, very helpful. You can see there that um, George, who made the post, is looking to, again, rent a room to girls in Leeds, but it's just for girls. You have to note that these people are very careful around how they phrase their advertisements. You know, they, they never overtly say what it is that they're recruiting these girls for. <laughs> What was also quite interesting was uh, there was a further post from, from George and the, the translation there, as you can see on the screen, he is essentially looking for anyone who works for Uber in Leeds or Bradford. Now, you may deduce that could be because he's looking to work for Uber. I deduced it was a set of a personal arrangement with a Romanian speaker to bring girls to their house in Leeds as a nice little social opportunity structure within that particular um, piece of organised crime. I said to you before that the, the Beatrice um, lady had liked one of George's posts and that took me to her Facebook profile, which is there, so that's the correct Beatrice. Now, even without, you know, blurring the image and with blurring the image, you can see that it's clearly a, a lady with dark brown hair and, and trust me, they are the same individuals. There were other little um, breadcrumbs, if you like, around the trail of this particular case. Um, one was from an adult service website um, where I identified um, Hall Road in Leeds. Um, to, to basically take me to her if I wanted to have a, a massage, if you like. Again, it was a massage, it wasn't anything else. Um, three, doing a, a drive-by with Google Maps. I kid you not. Um, I was able to identify the house. Um, I also identified that George was selling his car on Gumtree. He currently put his full vehicle registration number in the advert for me, which is very helpful. I was also able to cross-reference two Williams. Yes. <laughs> that is not a joke. And also a bunch of trees in their driveway. 
and that's also able to match the windows in their house to the background windows of the photographs that Beatrice had taken. I will 100% that I had the correct individuals. The money issue I had, however, with this is not only was it clearly recruitment for sex work, um, within the genuine profile of Beatrice on her Facebook, there was a young child. That, for me, raised a safeguarding issue. So again, that was reported to Leeds Police as well. So that took me quite a while, I'm not going to lie, in terms of you know, doing all that manually. So I thought, right, let's do it better, let's do it smarter, let's engage more with my technology experts. So I wanted greater technical input. So I went for a full socio-technical approach um, in terms of what I was going to do next. And unfortunately, the next thing that happened, happened in February last year, and you probably know where I'm going to go with this. Of course, trafficking from Ukraine. And of course, not long after Putin invaded Ukraine, there were lots of discussions around the displacement of women and children who were fleeing the country. Um, and I was involved in investigating, along with um, a group of Americans, the movement of women from Ukraine into neighboring countries. We focused on Moldova, again, it's a Romanian-speaking country, and I worked with Interpol last year doing some training for NGOs and health staff around how to identify victims of trafficking. So what we quickly realized was that traffickers are getting quite smart. There was, there was no doubt about that whatsoever. Um, in border countries, volunteers were told out to look for men offering young women rides at refugee centers. They were very nice. They were very encouraging. They were very supportive, very welcoming. The traffickers really, really switched up tactics. They had couples now rather than men. So again, the female may trust a female or another couple, for example. There were even stories, for example, around cooking traditional food, but you know, the smell would encourage people. Bear in mind they have, you know, had such an arduous journey from Ukraine into other countries. So there were lots of lures of food, energy snacks, fake friendship claims. This was all ongoing. Photograph on the screen is from a group of traffickers that was taken um, at the border within Ukraine. So again, what do we do from a technology background and what can we do in Northern Ireland? You know, hundreds and hundreds of miles away, if you like, from where all this situation is happening. Uh, there are various tools available, of course. Um, traffic jam, photo DNA, spotlight, all around the focus of identification. Um, the Americans have access to some controversial facial recognition that we in the UK don't have access to. Um, so they were able certainly to help from that aspect as well. So my perspective was we can look at technology to help us as a friend, but we can't truly really rely on it. So within the Ukraine situation, um, I took this work much further than the Romania one. So like I said, working in Moldova, and in particular, I looked again at recruitment. There are three websites that are particularly prone to posting suspicious adverts, let's just say. Robota.md, Mackler.md, and 999.md. Um, so through that, I thought, right, let's scrape the websites, let's identify and analyze the data, and let's see who's actually posting on these websites. Why did I do that? I want to find information, identifiers, phone numbers, email addresses, usernames, photographs. I want to see links and connections between users who post them, adverts, and also websites. I'm going to skim over these. You guys all know this. <laughs> different websites have similar information, but they have a different structure. Um, scraping is not that easy. It has to be said, particularly in different languages, and particularly if the websites aren't that well built. Every advert has key information for me. So a location, um, a phone number, as you can see, information about the person posting it, yet it was posted, the amount of money offered, email addresses, images, and how long the job may be for. Is it full-time, permanent, part-time, all of that information. 
What were the challenges? Like I said before, the website structure, websites changing, trying to get the right information extracted, and oh my goodness, working with Romanian was terrible, but also some adverts were in Cyrillic. That was just really, really quite awful. Then we have the other issue around translation. I'm not sure how many of you work with um, foreign languages, but trying to get automatic translation, it has got better, but my goodness, it really is still quite poor. Um, you know, sometimes we translate word by word, sometimes phrases ended up being that little bit more straightforward. I also learned that Google made a lot of mistakes. No offense to anyone from Google who may be in the room. So in terms of Google Translate, um, you can see my Moldovan audience find this very funny that um, the very bottom unskilled workers are at hammocks. I can guarantee right now that there was not a job, a job advert looking for a hammock. That failed translation actually meant a courier. So we're a long way off that one. So what did we notice from having scraped these websites? It was something really quite interesting. The registration date of advertisers, if you look at the donut on the screen and you've got a large blue chunk, the majority of advertisers had registered in 2022. So literally last year, whenever the invasion occurred. Now, were these people who were genuinely trying to help those fleeing from the war stricken Ukraine, or were there people there with nefarious intent? So that in itself was, it was a red flag for me. Like I said, I always rely on technology. Even looking at some of the, the manual adverts, I thought, you know, this is quite interesting. You know, tickets to Poland, cheap. You need to get there. You don't know how. You can come from any direction. Hmm. Okay, so I have a phone number, and again, through analysis of that phone number, you can pivot off and get a Gmail address, um, I can see the network it's connected to, I also have a Telegram account. So that allows me to go to various other pivot points around people's personal identifiers. So just to quickly summarize the trafficking aspect, um, my, my key takeaways, if you like, from doing this work and still involved in this work at the minute is be inquisitive. We, we have to really drill down to what we mean by trafficking and how technology can really help those individuals who are being trafficked. We just can't look to technology, but I'd really love you guys to work with us more um, and to really help us in terms of trying to think around tools that can help us identify suspicion, um, look at false adverts, um, word matching, you know, that kind of thing to really make our work that little bit easier in terms of victim identification and to reduce at source, of course, um, the recruitment of these individuals. And really, from our perspective, working together, we can then develop much better anti-trafficking initiatives. There's been a lot of work done in this area, but there's still a long, long, long way to go. Current research I'm also doing then is around child sexual abuse material. Like I said, I'm not talking about anything to do with the images. Do not worry um, around that today. Um, I'm particularly interested, however, in going after these people. And I look particularly at their operational security, their OSEC, and how they talk about technology, what steps they take to prevent themselves. So I'm trying to get into their heads around their security angle. Um, again, myself and my colleague, we scraped uh, a live forum, um, a particular sex offender forum, I'll not name it. And there, what we have done is we have taken all the usernames, all the avatars, and the entire discussions that were based on the entire um, forum, but particularly focusing on technology. Social scientists have done this before, but they've analysed a few hundred posts. We analysed over 123,000, and again, that was with the help of technology. Like I said, social scientists simply could not do that themselves. This forum has been active for quite a long time, since January 2012. You can see 123,000 posts, um, 11 sub-forums, um, 2,500 user profiles, and on average there are 1,100 posts per month. Now, like I say, I'm interested in the forum and the technology, so in terms of the forum, 
Like I said, it's been active from 2012. What's quite interesting from that graph is there's a, a huge dip around 2015. So somebody I need to ask me what happened in 2015. Thank you very much for asking the question. Um, the administrator got arrested. It took a while to find that out actually from the forum, but that's actually what happened. Um, and then you can see it came back online and there was more activity. And it sort of peaked and troughed. Whenever there's any kind of, you know, operations, you know, policing around this area, things go a little bit quiet. Whenever a website gets seized, it goes a bit quieter. But then sometimes, conversely, the, the chat increases as people displace from other forums, then join this one. So looking at the activity itself can be quite interesting. You can also see in terms of the number of posts you know, they, they peak around three and a half thousand and then they, they sort of dip again. And you can see that there was nothing really around 2014 as well. So something's really happened around that time. So actually looking at the activity itself can be really quite interesting. In terms of profiling the users, and again, from a social science perspective and from an intelligence perspective, it may come to surprise you, or maybe not, to be honest, around these individuals. They are very tech savvy, very, very much so. Um, there's clearly some experts who have experience or have worked within a technical background or within computer science or programming or the developers or whatever they may be, but they're very tech savvy and they will share technical information. Now, they generally deal with very trusted individuals. They will tell you how to stay safe online. In fact, there's an entire manual around how to stay safe online and how to avoid the cops, as they put it. So they're very good operational security, but they're also very nervous, very anxious about being discovered. And you can see that whenever a forum has been seized. They're wary of new users, um, they will discuss other sites, and of course they do discuss law enforcement operations. In terms of their avatars, I've blurred them because um, I just felt it was right to do that, despite the fact they're, they're not graphic avatars. Um, believe it or not, a lot don't actually choose to have them on their profile. Those that do, um, they may be off famous child actors, they could be off like famous brands like Pepsi and Kit Kat, for example, uh, and they could also be video game characters as well. But what I did discover from this particular forum was that they really like to exploit newer technology. They talk around how you can modify content around images, around audio, around video, for example. They talk a lot around high and quality content, 4K, 8K, virtual reality, and of course, augmented reality as well. So they're also adopting and exploiting newer technologies. In 2023, however, AI has really burst onto the scene. I don't have to tell any of you guys this, but trust me, the sex vendor community have also adopted it as well. And they're discussing a lot around how to alter and also create images using AI. And that's starting to cause a real problem for investigators, for building intelligence, and also for trying to identify um, real children and also how do we remove the fake children from investigations. So that's a huge issue. It's not a new issue, it's in the headlines, it's been well publicised um, throughout the UK in terms of how paedophiles are adopting some of this technology. I'll skim over the next couple of slides more quickly because I'm not getting near the end. Um, they talk about generative AI, um, they talk about open source tools that are available for them, they talk about DALI and DALI 2. Um, you know, and how they can easily remove any mitigations um, to exploit any of this technology. Again, the advancements have been really, really phenomenal over the last six to nine months, I would say, in terms of how images have changed. Um, probably one of the most obvious was at the Sony World Photography Awards earlier this year when the award was given to a person who created a fake AI image 
which leads me to a question, are you all still awake? I think you are, I'm going to test you right now. Okay. Can you tell the difference? So, the dogs, the one on the left and the one on the right. Who thinks the one on the left is a real image? Okay, you're wrong. <laughs> but thank you. I'm also conscious that maybe cut people in the room, so bear with me. <laughs> So, is the cat on the left? Is it a real image? You're wrong. <laughs> but thank you so much for, for playing along with me there. So, just very quickly, you know, seeing is not always believing, and this is a problem that we really have from a serious perspective in, in terms of this area. It's very difficult to identify, um, and research has been undertaken on this, looking at landscapes, people, objects, for example. But then, you know, we have a seat of doubt whenever we don't fully trust what we see online. So it's just trying to think about how we can really better you know, think around this and how we can remove this fear of doubt from what we do see online. So I'm almost wrapping up. So. Is AI, is it going to be a gateway to abuse more children or can it be used to prevent? There's a big, big debate around this at the minute. The key thing is that people who have uh, an interest in children, they will identify themselves as different. We're all about people just for what it's worth and we're trying to infringe their, their human rights. So there's some, you know, there's some questions, if you like, around how we can better use technology to dissuade individuals from adopting this particular aspect of AI. But what I would say is where I've seen users discussing AI, their conversations and commentary are much more graphic than what they have been in the past and that causes concern for me as an academic and an investigator and a researcher in this world. One of the, the issues is photorealism. Photos were hyper-realistic a few months ago and therefore they weren't interested because they, they, they were too perfect and now they're photorealistic and that, that's a big problem. So from an investigative concern, um, how, how do Cade identify photorealistic images? Cade is the Child Abuse Internet Database. Um, the Internet Watch Foundation, what's a real image? What's a fake image? What do they pull offline? In terms of virtual reality and forensic evidence, how do we seize evidence in a virtual environment? There's also greater commercial opportunities, particularly within the tech sector, where we have seen anecdotal evidence of some people with um, a skill set in this area using it for malintent. But there are some better takeaways that there is much, much more work now going in to develop tools to identify um, this AI-generated content. And the UK is probably almost leading the way, if you like, in terms of dealing with this in terms of a legal framework, certainly at the very least through the online harms bill that's going through legislation just now. And I'm just going to finish there. Thank you so much for listening.